Ed DeRosa back with you to dish on Keeneland with the Paddock Prince himself, David Levich. And uh, David, a interesting opening weekend. Uh, I have three somewhat specific, actually four stats to go over, get your impressions on. Uh, but first, more generally, uh, I know that uh, I think you and I finally had the first winner of our meet with delight. Didn't get much better for me, admittedly. Hopefully you picked up a few more winners, though. Yeah, the first day was a little – started off a little bad, and then the light picked it up at the end, and then I had a good Saturday. I thought we saw some really good performances on Saturday, some breakout performances. Horses like Annapolis, who really looks like one of those horses that went from – the older he's got as a three-year-old, caught up to the four-year-olds and ran a huge buyer, and looks like he'll be the second choice in the Breeders' Cup mile, obviously behind Modern Games, I'm sure, is also a three-year-old. And, yeah, no, I think there was a lot of big performances. I thought Loggins ran huge in defeat against Forte in the um, Futurity. I'm sure he'll move forward in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. But, yeah, I thought overall there He's was a lot of good breakout. He's going to have to with looming. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because they're both going to go to the lead, I feel like. I mean, they, Loggins was pretty quick out of the gate, and K-Brock's quick. So I'm not saying Forte is going to win, but it looks like horses like Forte are going to get that. Um, same kind of trip in there, but yeah, he's definitely gonna have to improve third time out against K Brock because K Brock's gonna be a heavy favorite. Yeah, we saw Nyquist uh, in 2015 was the juvenile winner, uh, much closer to the pace than we saw in 2020 with uh, Central Quality, uh, with Jackie's Warrior setting the pace that day. So, uh, juvenile races, I, I figure, will be fair. K Brock was impressive though. Uh, and speaking of two year olds, uh, I thought one of the uh, at least visually impressive performances was Hit Show, uh, who was the only debut winner on the weekend. One for 26 uh, among all the debut runners, two-year-olds and up, whatever. He was the only one. And for all that, duck into the rail, accelerating, which uh, is super impressive to me for two-year-olds to do. For all that, he got a lowly 59 buyer. Yeah, that was a little surprising to me, to be honest, because I thought his debut was pretty impressive. But I guess that's why it's not a visual game. And then like an hour later, the Ben Colbrook horse got a 79, same to everything, distance and all that. So I don't know if I believe that. That might be one of those ones. I got to see him run back. I'm sure he'll run back on that Stars of Tomorrow card at Churchill in a non-1X or something. And if he runs right. well on that, point to the stakes at the end of the meet. But I don't know about that. I got to see that again because – that looked it looks pretty good, but I, obviously times and all that are a different story. Yeah, I always just think, I mean, two year olds, uh, you know, some of them are at whatever stage they end up debuting, just better than those in that race, and they're able to blitz them. And we see that with Wesley Ward, to use an extreme example in the spring, they're just better, they're faster out of the gate, etc. Uh, to win like he did uh, in that situation, uh, I I just thought was impressive, and not saying that means it needs to be a fast race per se. But 59 is not good. I mean, that is not a horse who is going to win a stakes if that number is true. No, and you kind of got to take it for like Justique, who ran that big race at Del Mar and then only got a 72 buyer at the beginning of the Del Mar meet, came back to run in the um, Chandelier this past weekend, and it kind of backed up that she's not nearly as good as right. she looked in her debut. So it could be one of those visually impressive horses that comes back and is way over bed and <laughs> run for where he where he should but didn't you think weren't you the one who tweeted that's the derby winner yeah i was just having some fun trolling trolling well, I, don't I saw you tweet it, it, it was more like every race at like when saratoga you get this flashy main winner, <laughs> yeah. you know bafford at, at del mar so i i just kind of wanted to get in in on the fun at keeneland no and that horse might have set up the too, joke because... with malathot that I was able to say, oh, we just saw the 2021 Oaks winner. She was good. She she proved you right, though. Well, she's she's going to win the distaff. Maybe. We'll see. Well, I have a stat about that, so everyone should like and subscribe because Sarah and I are going to do a video where I will reveal all, and it, it's mind-blowing. I'm very excited to share. Speaking of stats, though – Kentucky Downs, not what not doing too well uh, this meet. They were just uh, it's four point eight percent. We have a graphic we'll put up so everyone can see everything. Uh, sixty two starts, just four point eight percent winners. So I think that's three for sixty two. 
typically the shippers from Franklin do much better when they come north to Church Churchill or Keeneland. Not the case so far this meet. Uh, any insight into that? Or uh, as we see on this chart, there were quite a few Saratoga shippers as well. Uh, maybe the New York horses are better this year. Yeah, I don't know. I never know what to do with Kentucky Downs horses because <laughs> I was just looking at Thursday's card, and there's a couple running in their allowance race on Thursday at the end of the card. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's really hard to read too because that Kentucky Downs course can get real inside biasy, and it, I'm not a big fan of Kentucky Downs horses. I would rather have New York horses, and like you said, New York horses have done well. If I'm going to look between the two and I see two horses that have similar numbers, I'm always going to take the New York horse in that case. But Kentucky Downs is truly a course you have to handle, and things have to go right for you. And so I'm not a big Kentucky Downs shipper person, but if the horse looks unbeatable, I'll use them. But it's not my cup of tea to use Kentucky right, Downs well, horses. And they haven't uh, been been the tea at uh, Keeneland either. Here's another stat for you. Dirt sprints uh, at Keeneland, one-turn races, I call it. So this covers five and a half up to the Beard course. The rail, 0 for 17. Post 3, 0 for 17. Post 2, 2 for 17. So the rail's 0 for, and post 1 through 3 are 2 for 51. Inside, not the place to be sprinting. Now, we have seen horses come up the rail and win in the stretch, but for whatever reason, on that backside, being down inside has not been ideal. Yeah, that is odd because the rail hasn't been dead or anything. You've seen a lot of horses win on the rail. I just, yeah. I guess. You'd have, I'd have to you'd have to go back and look at the odds. I don't know how many favorites have been on in post one, two, or three, but I think it's just one of those things. Horses probably not breaking well long shots, but the rail, like I said, has been fair. So I think it's just been a little anomaly, I guess. Yeah, it, and you know, admittedly, we're looking at seventeen races with at least six horses, and then then on down, there's been one race with twelve, two with eleven, um, or excuse me, one with twelve, one with eleven, uh, but. An outside horse has one, an inside horse hasn't. So, yeah, it's one of those odd, like, well, and a lot can change. This is a five-day week now, different, a little different racing than Fall Stars weekend. Uh, but, oh, like, 0 for 17 gets into my head a little bit more than, like, 0 for 5 on opening day would. Yeah, and I, like you said, with a five-day week and the racing definitely changes. I mean, on Thursday, there's so many starters and claimers, so – you know, the horse quality is going to go down a little bit as expected after such a big weekend with a lot of stake races and maiden races. So I think those stats could change, but I don't know. It, post one can be difficult sprinting, especially if you don't break. Well, it's obviously not like a mile and a 16th where you can make up, you can make position. If you don't break well and post one, two or three, more one and two, you're kind of in trouble. Yeah. And the, the track is so forward. I talked about this on, on Twitter leading up to the start of the meet, but you know, the, the, the top rank by Karen speed points, which is, you know, pretty simple calculation Brisnet does, but it's basically an early speed indicator. And I'd have no doubt that, you know, the time form us pace projector is probably in a similar ballpark with identifying likely contenders based on early speed, but positive flatbed ROI, the last four meets it's continued through the first three days of this meet. And if you get out in front from a middle or outside post position, and you're jammed down on the rail from the inside, you you have no chance. Yeah, Keeneland is, I mean, that especially in those mile and a 16th races, that first wire comes up so fast. <laughs> really, Keeneland, you you rarely see horses come from dead last, and, and especially in the short stretch races. And the sprint races, I mean, when I handicap Keeneland, I'm always looking for horses that are first, second, or third. Yeah, I don't really look at post as much. Obviously, those stats are a little alarming. But, I mean, when you look at Keeneland, do you rarely see races collapse no matter the pace? So when I look at them, I'm looking for horses that are on the pace close or maybe a little mid-pack. And we have a uh, – I'm going to pull it up uh, and see if that gives some insight. But the track trends tool, which in this case – would just show the two winners down inside anyway, but uh, it, it breaks down posts by running style as well. And and I would think, um, you know, talk about closers being at a disadvantage from the rail. That definitely makes sense based on everything we've talked about. But all that said, even at the 0 for 17, if I'm on a horse who I think can break cleanly from the gate and be on top from the inside, I'm fine with that. 
but they absolutely have to have speed. Yeah, if I'm going to play a horse from one, two, or three, it's got to be a horse with speed at Keeneland. It's not, yeah. I'm not looking for a horse, no matter the odds from one, two, or three, if they're trying to come from behind, because it's so difficult to make up a, a lot of ground there. One thing uh, I would say I, I had right, although I did not use it to any financial benefit, unfortunately, and I forget if we talked about it, if it was with Sarah looking ahead to the the stakes with Forte, but uh, Todd Pletcher, who did not have a great Churchill meeting, is one of only two trainers with three wins at the current Keeneland meet. The other is Al Stahl. He was three for six, Pletcher three for seven. Uh, two of Pletcher's three, however, came in grade one races. Uh, so d- he definitely gets the gold star among the conditioners. But uh, he he came to play, David. You can, As yeah, I, you know, I'm starting so. to learn. Yeah, but I'm starting to learn with his Churchill shippers. You do not want his Churchill horses, the ones no. that are baits there, because <laughs> you almost feel like there is D string, because he sends his, obviously, his good ones to New York, and then he has his Gulf string string going now. So, Unless a horse is coming from New York, I really am not going to play his horses at Churchill for the most part. But, yeah, no, he came to play. I mean, he always runs well at Keeneland. I think he's the all-time winning stakes trainer at Keeneland. And, mm-hmm. you know, you had horses like Forte and Annapolis shipping in. I'm sure you'll get some more shippers coming up in the next couple of weeks because I think he got a full barn of horses there is what I heard. So, I expect to see. And, you know, his contingent's already there for the Breeders' Cup. So, it seems like he's really taking this Keeneland meet, um, fall meet seriously leading up to the Breeders' Cup, which obviously is at Keeneland. He's a, uh, a tactician for sure. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Kenny McPeak, 0 for 12. Brendan Walsh, 0 for 9. Lucas and Wilkes, both 0 for 7. Vicky Oliver, 0 for 6. Sharp and Brissett. 0 for 5, and those are all names with, I guess, maybe the exception of Vicky Oliver and Lucas, who take money, and uh, a lot of goose eggs there. Now, it's early in the meet, and the the wins have been spread around otherwise, so they can't all win, but uh, those are some big names that haven't found the winner's circle yet. Yeah, I was a little disappointed in Brendan Walsh's horses. He had some really live horses um, this past weekend, including that million dollar into mischief that was in the outside that looked like he was going to go right by everybody in the stretch. And he kind of just, he hit a wall. And then Santine didn't break great in the um, Coolmore Mile. So he gets a little bit of a pass. But, how, you know, mentioned in those guys' names, I really thought Brendan Walsh's horses were a little underperforming. Yeah, no, uh, no doubt at 0 for 9. And like you said, not. Not with live, not horses, with all slouches either. I mean, there were well met horses uh, under his care, and then uh, you know, I mean, Ken McPeak. He was on the the Ron Flatter Racing podcast. I'm not actually sure if any of those twelve were favored, so I, you know, I don't know what the expectation was. And I know he had a few r- true bombs uh, among that group, but still, a, bit, a, a name like that that wins as often as he does in Kentucky, uh, the O for twelve sticks out. But I have a bet. If you remember from last week, I had Brian Hernandez, flat bat and dirt races. So I need Kenny to get hot because uh, Brian's who rides for him, and he was 0 for 5 in those races. So uh, I'm down 50 already. Yeah, you're in trouble on that bet because I was I was looking tomorrow on Wednesday. Kenny McPeak's going to get off the duck tomorrow. I think it's race 7, the, okay. the non one for two-year-olds. But Frank's on, I think his name's Frank's on. He won at Churchill by 5, I think. This is, it's been a couple of days since I looked, but Julian's riding him for some reason. Mm-hmm. Brian's riding the other McPeak, but I don't know if you put too much into that. But Brian, um, I mean, Brian, I'd all you need is one or two. You think can win? <laughs> yeah, but McPeak, you know, he doesn't really take money that often. So if Brian wins on a couple of McPeak horses, you could be in, and right. Wilkes. I think we talked about this last week. Brian does not ride for um, a bunch of big names and, you know, low uh, people that take money, should I say. And then obviously next week, I think Rosario and the Ortiz brothers are suspended. So a lot of these low, and, you know, you got guys going back to New York, like I read right. Brad and Jose are all in New York on Friday. So you'll start to see some of the local. I don't think Julian won a race either. So you'll start to see some of these local guys um, pick up some steam, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Julian uh, came in hot, but uh, waters get pretty deep fall stars weekend uh, with, with the colony that uh, tracks the New York guys as well. Queen Elizabeth on Saturday. uh, That's I think the last grade one until breeders cup. So uh, we'll, we'll be full, full flight, uh, pardon the pun 
uh, toward the big day, first weekend in November, but uh, we'll keep doing this every week and certainly add some more Breeders' Cup flavor as we get closer to it and monitoring the Keeneland stuff. But uh, any parting words on uh, now that the preps are all finished? No, I think there's there, – I was reading that um, on Friday they have the Sycamore, which is the last uh, – it's a marathon turf race. And then I was seeing that – saw that Mayor Mission is going to go to the Breeders' Cup if he runs well. So oh, okay. I think there's a couple horses in that race that – I mean, it's a very, very good race. So I think that right. – it's not technically a Breeders' Cup prep, but I think you see a few horses go to the turf out of that race if they run well. And it's it's an absolutely loaded field for a grade three. Sure. And speaking of turf, I thought Warlike Goddess was uh, spectacular in the Hirsch and uh, certainly looking for I'm, I'm thinking for them to prep in that race. They're going to they're going to stick with the, the turf against males. Yeah, they are. I thought I read that he was going and I really hope that Jose Lescano rides the horse. Cause I think Jose Lescano is the most underrated rider and he's not one of those guys that he lets. Ho- I mean, obviously, Rosario was great. He won the Eclipse last year. But you really felt like Lescano is really just going to let her run no matter what. Rosario kind of takes her back and makes that one run. Lescano had her in third early on in the yeah, race. that was great. So I don't know what they're going to do because he obviously took Julian off and put Rosario on, and then Lescano <laughs> rides are perfect. So I, I, obviously, if Rosario rides, it's fine. But I think if Lescano rode, that that would be really interesting because I think he's very yeah, and it, I mean, it actually might – I mean, that's a situation too. It's like – to me, probably worth an odds point. One hundred percent. I almost said yeah. that too. Is when you see Rosario Lescano, people are going to bet Rosario over Lescano's. And I mean, Lescano doesn't even really. I mean, he rides for Big Barnes, but he's not riding for Chad or Pletcher on all those guys on a constant right. basis. But he showed last weekend when he gets you know capable horses. He won the Vosburg and the uh, more like got the Joe Hirsch. So he's obviously a very capable rider, and he's the most. Was his ride the most famous sub in ride of all time on Wise Dan? No, that's, <laughs> that's a good point. I mean, that was an unbelievable sub in ride. Yeah. No, very, uh, like, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the guy that Lou Gehrig replaced. That's before Not that my Johnny D lost him out, but that's always like what you think of when you get that sub. Yeah, that was no. so. I mean, Les Cano's been in this position before, but yeah, no, like you said, we're like, God, it's got a 105 buyer, and yeah, that was three smart. turns is key for that was a big effort. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, hopefully, a big effort from your picks this week. Hopefully, a big effort from Brian Hernandez on the main track for me. And uh, we'll talk next week. And at that point, we'll be what two and a half weeks out, two and a half weeks out. So, we got a couple five day weeks at Keeneland racing weeks, and then we'll be there. All right. Well, he's David, the Paddock Prince. I'm Ed. We're with Horse Racing Nation. Link at the bottom for all your Paddock Prince pick needs. Like and subscribe, and we'll be back next week. Looking forward to it.